My pleasure to introduce Dr. CX Zhang, who's a principal investigator and staff scientist at JCAP, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis here at Caltech. And CX is a domain expert for purpose of our workshop, but more generally world expert on solar fuels generators. And he's going to talk to us about uh, electrochemical and photoelectrochemical generation of fuel from CO2, water, and uh, to generate oxygen. Uh, and so he's also an expert in modeling of uh, uh, devices uh, using sort of chemical engineering approaches. And I think we'll have a lot to contribute to our idea development during the workshop. So CX. All right, thank you for the kind introduction, Harry. Uh, so I will give you a tutorial on photoelectrochemical devices that convert CO2 and water into fuels and uh, oxygens. Um, so, well, okay. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to talk to you about the basic operating principles of a photoelectrochemical CO2 reduction system. And then I'm going to dive into the individual materials and then components in a PEC CO2 R system. At the end, I will talk about the device designs and integrations, as well as the state of art demonstration of PEC CO2 R systems. So, first of all, what is a uh, PEC CO2 R system? So, the system takes the sunlight, water, and, uh, and CO2 and generate oxygen and fuels. And one thing I want, want to point out at the beginning is that, well, that is particularly relevant to this workshop is, you know, water here is really the proton source. If your target fuel does not contain proton, such as carbon monoxide, the water is really optional for the whole system. And in the system, essentially, you have a photoabsorber that captures the sunlight. It generates photo, uh, photo generate electron holes and transport them to the uh, reaction sites. And for the electrochemical process, you essentially have two half reactions. One water oxidation reaction takes place at the anode, and the cathode, you have CO2 reduction uh, reaction. And here, as you can see, that if we're making CO, you're generating a water molecule at the cathode. So overall, you're not really consuming any water for CO2 to CO reduction. For anything else, formate, methanol, and methane, uh, you will need a proton source. And in this tutorial, I'm going to focus on water as the uh, proton source. And that's uh, most of the people do on Earth anyways. So uh, there are a few key materials in the system that I talked about, the photoabsorber, uh, the CO2 reduction catalyst, and the oxygen evolution catalyst. And there are a few key components in the system that, you know, how you get the CO2 and water to the electro surface as well as the ionic transport between the cathode and anode. So every electron you put into the cathode, you will need the corresponding ionic movement to maintain the charge neutrality in the system. And also at the end, you have product separation issue. You want to robustly uh, separate the product, uh, product and collect uh, the fuse from your system. Uh, one of the most important metrics for the system is obviously the conversion efficiency of the system. We also need to consider the selectivity, stability, and the scalability of the system uh, later on. So in this tutorial, I hopefully I will very briefly touch upon all these uh, materials and components and give you an overview on uh, um, where we are for the CO2 uh, reduction. So one way to think about the operating principle of the system is really to consider the photoabsorber as the, as the power uh, component of the system, and the rest of the system is the electrochemical load. So essentially, uh, the photoabsorber will produce uh, the photodial curve or the power curve at different illumination intensities, as shown here. And the electrochemical load curve essentially tells you, you know, if you apply a certain voltage, uh, how fast you're driving the overall reaction. And the electrochemical load curve has many components uh, uh, in it. One is the thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamic voltage window of the overall reaction. For instance, if you're making CO2 to CO and making water uh, oxidation reaction, the voltage window is something around 1.3 volt. Okay, so that's the minimal you will need to drive the overall reaction. 
And then you have kinetic overpotential for OER reaction and CO2R reaction. So that depends on how good your catalysts are and what is your target fuel. So for CO2 reduction, <clears throat> the kinetic overpotential can range from tens of millivolts all the way to way over a volt. Uh, additional voltage loss in the overall load curve, including concentration of potential due to the reactant and products. Essentially, you have to pay a, a, a voltage penalty. So there's an additional voltage needs to apply when the concentration of your uh, reactant and product uh, deviates from their bulk value. Right? And also, there's ionic transport loss that you want to minimize. So the last two is very as much associated uh, to the detailed cell design, cell architecture, you want to minimize these losses uh, in the system. So once you have the overall load curve and the power curve, that determines the operating point of the system. And the current density that you read out essentially gives you uh, the overall fuel generation rate uh, of the system. So one thing I want to point out is that although there are, seems to be a lot of uh, materials and components in the system, when the system in operation, there's only one, it produce one single uh, rate of reaction. So all these rate, you know, you cannot have one rate go faster than the other. All these physicalchemical processes has to be well coupled together in order to uh, produce a, a device efficiency. So what I told you is it's one way uh, uh, to, to, to analyze a system. It's a one-dimensional analysis. And for a prototype device that has a finite dimension, you really want to use a multi-physics, uh, multi-dimensional model to understand most of the physicalchemical processes involved in the device to uh, fully predict the cell performance. For instance, you can have a variation of fuel production rate along the electrode width, or you can have a pH gradient in your system that will change the system efficiency significantly. So, Hopefully, I give you a rough idea about how the whole system looks like. Then we're going to dive into the materials and components that are available to us today, and what are the challenges and opportunities uh, uh, in, in, in the individual uh, materials. So first of all, is the photoabsorber. The photoabsorber is really kind of the engine of the system. It provides you the necessary current and voltage to drive the overall reaction. And the performance of of the photoabsorber uh, depends significantly on the uh, spectrum of your uh, solar, solar light. And this is a uh, solar spectrum on Earth with the air mass coefficient of 1.5. And um, people, uh, previous speakers have showed, you know, on Mars it's probably going to be a very different uh, solar spectrum with overall lighting since they're very different from the Earth. So that's something to consider when you're designing a photoabsorber, what kind of band gap or what kind of material that you want to use to optimize the efficiency uh, for PV on Mars. So once you have uh, a photoabsorber, essentially the incident photon getting absorbed in, the, in a photoabsorber material, it's a typically a, a semiconducting material, the photogenic electron holes will find their ways to, uh, to the two terminals because of the uh, building asymmetry at the junction. The junction can be a solid state, solid state junction, more like a traditional PV materials, or it can be a semiconductor liquid junction where the uh, carrier separation and carrier transport takes place at the semi semiconductor uh, liquid interface. So I want, just want to show you a few uh, power curves from a single uh, junction photoabsorber that's made of, for instance, garlic arsenide or silicon or cateride. As you can see, that uh, the voltage of, of these cells are, are often limited because of the band gap of the material. And, and uh, a PV single junction cell alone will not be able to drive the overall reaction because, as I mentioned, this 1.3 volt that's open that's the thermodynamic voltage window for the overall reaction. So one trick to do is stack up uh, semiconductors to make tandem junction or triple junction materials. So essentially, you add those voltage up for those uh, photoabsorbers, and they share the, sa uh, share the same current. And here are a few photodial curves for a triple junction uh, cells that's made out of three fine material, the Indian gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide, germanium substrates, or amorphous silicon, so the voltage can be uh, over 
uh, to volts. And if you, we look at a, a typical electrochemical load for CO2 to CO generation at 10 million per centimeter square, and you add up all the uh, components for the overall load analysis, you know, you're looking at a voltage close to two volts. And, and that, that two volts is, for, for some of the triple junction materials available today, that is close to the power point or maximum power point of the, uh, of the PV device. But keep in mind, that's, that's just one reaction. And I'll talk about that reaction a little bit uh, in a few minutes. And, and that's arguably one of a few reactions that we know how to do quite well. But if you were to try something different, if you would try to make meth methane at a similar rate, uh, the kinetic oil potential for CO2 reduction is significantly higher. And it's 1.4 volts using the state-of-art uh, CO2 R catalyst. It's not very efficient. It's not uh, very selective. So there you will need a higher operating voltage to drive the overall reaction. And one way to do that is completely redesign the band gap combination of the triple junction cells. And people have simulated the performance essentially using shock equalizer limit of the photoabsorber, the theoretical limit of the photoabsorber at the triple junction configuration. And then they find that the maximum efficiency is at um, slightly be below 7%. Now, the alternative will be to, if you really need a high voltage to drive the reaction alternatively, you could couple several PVs either in series or in parallel to give you the optimal power curve. And one example here is that a, a report done by a, by a, a research group in Japan. They have uh, series connected um, silicon single junction absorbers, uh, four of them, and then connect them in parallel to produce the optimal power curve to do a uh, water splitting reaction. So the silicon only gives off something like 400 to 500 millivolts VOC, but by series connecting them, it can produce enough power to do the water splitting, which requires at least 1.23 volt to do. So you can envision something like that for the PC co 2 r device, essentially uh, doing optim optimization using very efficient PV cells. <coughs> uh, the second part of the puzzle is the CO2 reduction catalyst. Um, arguably, we can perform CO2 to CO or formate quite well electrochemically. And here is one proposed schematic of how CO2 is getting reduced to CO or formate on a heterogeneous catalyst. So you take one proton, one electron, make COOH, another proton and electron to make CO and water. Or you can take a proton and electron, make OCHO, and then another proton and electron to make formic acid or formate. And if you look at a kind of summarized performance of many material systems for CO2 to CO conversion at very mild conditions, you know, near room temperature uh, and also near one atmosphere CO2, there are quite a few systems that can perform uh, CO2 to CO pretty well, near unity, very efficiency, at low over potential, and drive at uh, tens of milliamp per centimeter squared. So we know how to make CO quite well, I would say. And also, we, arguably, we know how to make hydrogen pretty well. So if you mix those together, that's syngas. So there has been some uh, demonstration or reports on how to make syngas efficiently uh, in a, a pilot plant uh, scale with a good uh, energy efficiency. Now, I would just want to give you a few specific examples on how to make CO2 to CO. It turns out that. Uh, both heterogeneous catalysts and molecular catalysts can do CO2 to CO or formate transformation quite well. Uh, and this, this is essentially the example that you're using a palladium nanoparticle that is suspended or coated onto a carbon cloth or carbon support substrate. You are driving CO2 to, to formate near unity ferry efficiency at only 50 millivolt over potential at a, at a decent um, decent turnover frequency. Um, for the molecular catalyst, a rhenium-based uh, molecular catalyst has been studied coupled with a p-type uh, silicon from Professor Kubiak's group. And um, it has shown a very decent uh, photovoltage. 
based on the p-type silicon as well as a good uh, turnover frequency from the catalyst. Uh, people know how to do CO2 to form a reaction quite well a while ago using biologic enzymes and essentially you're using uh, form uh, enzymes that uh, coupled to a semiconductor p-type indium phosphide using an electron relay to give off uh, electrons to the biologic enzyme and they are producing formate at near similar dynamic potential of CO2 to formate uh, reaction. Uh, the problem with bioelectric enzymes is that they, they don't live long enough and, and the current density is, is fairly low. So that's CO2 to formate. What about, uh, what about everything else? Well, uh, everything else, arguably, uh, we don't know how to make it very well. Uh, even for a uh, one carbon product such as uh, methane or uh, methanol, uh, here's a summarized plot of, of um, how, how good we are at make methane and methanol. And the copper electrode, which was studied decades ago, are still among the state-of-art catalyst for CO2 to methane conversion. And you need over a volt over potential, and the Faraday, uh, uh, Faraday, Faraday efficiency is, is not very high. So there is um, an increased interest both in JCAB and also in the, um, in the community uh, overall to design sch uh, schematics and strategies to make materials that can produce CO2 to liquid fuels better than CO and formate more selectively and more efficiently. And that is, I would say, uh, one of the bottleneck of this technology is finding the right catalyst for the CO2 reduction. So moving on, the oxygen evolution reaction, that's the last material that's needed for the overall system, is arguably uh, more straightforward because the selectivity. You can, there's not much you can oxidize to uh, except oxygen. And uh, a benchmark team in JCAB over the past few years has benchmarked a variety of metal, metal oxides uh, in terms of what is the kinetic over potential at 10 milliamp per centimeter square before and after two hours of uh, stability test. And uh, to summarize is that essentially in acid, um, the only stable catalyst is iridium oxide and um, there's not really anything else. For the base, we find a range of metal oxides that the performance uh, are, are clustered at, at in this region um, that produce similar kinetic oil potential for oxygen evolution reaction. And the recent science report summarizes the state of art uh, metal oxides for the oxygen evolution reaction. And, and these metal oxides, you know, you make it one way or the other, provide, give you an over potential between 200 millivolts to 300 millivolts. So these are the material choices, uh, uh, materials that we could use for oxygen evolution reaction. Now I've talked about, hopefully very briefly, um, all three materials. I would like to uh, briefly touch upon a few key components. One is how you would deliver CO2 to your electrode surface. And that's very important because when the CO2 concentration at your electrode surface drops to close to zero, you will pay a huge voltage penalty. Um, and the device is likely to cease to operate. So you want to have a robust way to deliver CO2 to your electro. And in this community, there are a few schematics that, that you could do that. One way is to, uh, as previous speaker mentioned, the reaction always goes better when you're at elevated pressure. And that's the case for CO2 reduction as well. If you bring the CO2 pressure to uh, 50 atmosphere or 100 atmosphere, suddenly one of the best oxygen evolution catalyst platinum, uh, it, it can do CO2 reduction uh, at, at, a, at a decent rate. So operating at elevated temperature, you could maintain a, a constant CO2 concentration at the gas liquid solid interface by using a gas diffusion electrodes. That has been uh, studied as well, where your CO2 uh, flux would not be limited at least to uh, hundreds of milliamp per centimeter square. Another attractive way would be to use non-aqueous solvent instead of aqueous solvent, where the solubility of CO2 is uh, 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 20 or 30 times better than in aqueous solution. So people you've used ionic liquid, imidazolium-based ionic liquids, and amines. And all these strategies try to 
maintain a high concentration of CO2 at the lateral surface, not only kind of increase the attainable CO2 current density, but also improve the fairly efficiency of the, of the device. Essentially, you're making uh, uh, more fractionally more CO2 reduction in relative to hydrogen evolution reaction, which is something you want to suppress. So these are the few ways people have, have thought about and had done some experiment about to, uh, to explore how you would deliver CO2 to the electrosurface. surface. And the last thing I want to mention is the ionic <coughs> transport between the cathode and anode as well as the product separation. And, and that we can really learn a lot from a PC water splitting uh, community that essentially also the, the water electrolysis community. Uh, as I show that uh, most of the water electrolysis, um, is as, at least commercially, is taking place at extreme pHs. And there are a few materials that people use to separate the, uh, the fuels and provide ionic transports. One is to use um, ceramics or microporous materials to transport OH- in a extreme alkaline conditions, or use a, a polymer electrolyte such as Nathion to transport um, proton between the cathode and anode and also block the um, product crossover. Or this is a solid oxide electrolyzer. You're transporting O2 minus instead of, instead of uh, H2 and OH minus at a significantly higher operating uh, temperature. Now, these are extreme pHs. Now, the CO2 reduction photoelectrochemically doesn't work so well in extreme pHs because in alkaline conditions, you run out of CO2 because it makes bicarbonate. And in extreme acid condition, you have too much proton around. The selectivity of the device is, uh, is not so good. Uh, so you, most of the work done in this area is at near neutral pHs, uh, around pH 7 to pH 8, where you have a, a good mid midpoint for the CO2 reduction. And there are a couple of ways that you can, uh, that you can do the ionic transport in the uh, near neutral pH one is still using a traditional nathion, you know, cation exchange membrane. So instead of proton carrying the ionic current, now you have cocations such as sodium and potassium transport the uh, transport the uh, charges, and you have to recirculate or recondition it every so often so that you don't electrodialyze your solution and give you a huge uh, voltage loss. Another way would be to use a so-called bipolar membrane where you provide protons and OH minus to the cathode and anode by water dissociation uh, taking place at the, um, at the membrane interface. And, and these are some of the techniques that people use for the water splitting and it is uh, it's likely to be applicable for CO2 reduction. Um, so that's, that's uh, one part of the um, system component that you want to consider uh, when you de develop such a system. Uh, the last part, uh, I think still have a few minutes, is to give you an idea about the device designs and, and what's are out there in terms of the state-of-the-art state of demonstrations of the PEC CO2R device. So the first design, I would say, is a standalone PV plus MEA design. That is, you have the photoabsorber part that is physically separated from your electrochemical component. And those two components are often optimized individually, right? Now these are the two state-of-art demonstration of series connected photoabsorber with a membrane electro assembly. In this case, you have uh, three provoscite cells connected in series to provide enough voltage to do the CO2 reduction to CL. They use iridium oxide for the uh, oxygen evolution and a uh, structured gold catalyst for CO2 to CO reduction. And this is the highest PEC CO2 RR conversion efficiency at 6.5% uh, solar to fuel uh, conversion efficiency. People have tried to use series and parallel connected CIGS modules, the same idea uh, to a more like a fuel cell assembly where you have a membrane separator to separate the products and a 4.5% uh, efficiency was, uh, was reported. Um, so going forward is that we can, we can always uh, have a lot of inspirations and, and, and uh, guidelines from the PEC water splitting um, research. And one way that people have done that is that uh, 
uh, a research group in Japan showed above 20% solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency by using high efficient PV materials <coughs> coupled with a solar concentrator. Right? So in there, essentially the subsystem optimization very much takes place on how you coupling the CPV module with various of electrochemical load to provide the maximum uh, power for solar to hydrogen evolution. So this is essentially coupling a solar concentrator to a PV plus MEA design. So that's something that CO2RR system might think about using. Uh, the second device architecture, I would say, is the integrated macroscopic planar devices. So in this device, it's very different from the previous device design. Essentially, the catalysts are directly or intimately coupled to a photoabsorber, right, and to provide and produce a monolithic device. And these are the uh, state-of-art demonstration of a monolithic device that produces uh, a few percent solar to formate uh, conversion efficiency. Both of them use a amorphous silicon, uh, triple junction amorphous silicon in the photoabsorber. They've coat iridium oxide to the photoanode and use a ruthenium complex polymer catalyst uh, dispersed into a carbon cloth as the dark cathode. So these devices are, um, um, the form factor of these devices are very different. Essentially, you're looking at a, a piece of paper and then you're dunking to a solution and making fuse and oxygen from both sides of the film. And JCAP Caltech team has been working on something like that, but uh, we, we, we have seen uh, solar to form a conversion efficiency exceeding 10%, so that's something that uh, will come up soon. <coughs> now, again, for the integrated planar device, you could also couple a solar concentrator to a, a fully integrated device and, and such design actually has been proposed and the canonic analysis of the device has been done quite a while ago and there is a, a, a big cost reduction in terms of coupling a solar concentrator to an integrated device because you use less photoabsorber material, use less um, catalyst material and use less uh, the membrane separator materials. Uh, the actual device has yet to be demonstrated but there have been modeling and simulation done to understand the attainable efficiency of such a system, as well as uh, the detailed dimension of a such, such a system, how you would uh, actually build it. And there's also a uh, inherent advantage of uh, integrated device, that is, the efficiency of integra integrated device is not so sensitive to the light intensity as well as the operating uh, temperature, because there's a self-compensating mechanism between the PV material and the catalyst material. When the temperature goes higher, the PV degrades because they enhance the recombination process, but the, tank, uh, but the catalyst works a lot better. So overall, your cell efficiency is kind of maintained at a, at a constant level. I think I'm running out of time soon, but there's a few more designs that I want, want to mention that really is, is something, really is a, a kind of inspiration from a PEC water splitting system. One is, instead of using liquid water, you could use uh, vapor fat uh, water. So there you can use, uh, you know, for instance, people have demonstrated very recently, use on pure seawater and you drive off the vapor from the seawater, use the water vapor as a feedstock to drive the overall reaction. And the, the device showed a uh, decent uh, efficiency as well as stability. Modeling and simulation has reviewed quite a few designs that you could use vapor water instead of liquid water to drive the overall reaction. And uh, there's several potential advantages of using vapor fat device, in, uh, uh, including if you're making liquid fuel, it's a lot easier to separate the product. Essentially, you wick out, wick out the liquid fuel uh, while you're providing the vapor to the, to the whole device. Uh, another design that is very different from any of the other design I just talked about, uh, but is also well known in the PEC water splitting community is a, a baggy design. So in a baggy design, essentially you have um, catalyst coated photoabsorbers, often in a nanoparticle format. And you can either have a one baggy system uh, that having the fuel forming reaction and oxygen, re oxygen evolution reaction take place in the same bag, 
or you can have two baggy system where the, you have an additional redox shuttle uh, to compensate the charges and have the two reaction taking place at two baggies. Now the key is really to develop a catalyst that can perform the reaction uh, very selectively because um, you want to, for instance, at the anode you want to make water oxidation reaction but not try to oxidize the redox shuttle. And the recent demonstration has been shown that you can actually produce uh, a few percent solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency by using so-called uh, a solar paint. So that's a very cheap way of uh, making such a device. The last thing I want to mention is a, um, a integrated microwire device that essentially consists of a photocathode and photoanode in a microwire form and a catalyst has been decorated onto the cathode and anode. And especially JCAP has put a lot of effort into uh, demonstrating such a device for solar driven water splitting reactions. Uh, there are many variations of this schematic. You can, uh, this is one variation we call the Q-tip. Essentially you have a wrap around contact where you have two junctions folded together. And these are microwires embedded in a polymer, uh, in a polymer electrolyte where the polymer provides the mechanical support for the whole device. So at the end of the day, you're envisioning something that you would roll out like artificial turf. Uh, it looks very different from a traditional PV panel. You will roll it out and supply with water, CO2, and sunlight and wicks out the fuel uh, in, a, in a cheap uh, and a scalable way. So that's some of the design that I want to mention. And, and let me just conclude with the beginning slide and hopefully give you some idea about both the materials, components, and overall uh, how, how a pcco 2 r system would look like. And uh, that's all. I'm happy to take any questions.